The gospel reading comes to us from the gospel according to John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the Word of the Lord. May be seated. Grace and peace to you this morning from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, So one thing I failed to mention as we gathered this morning or at the beginning, um, we have a group also, you'll see a couple vans out here, but a group of our high school students just came back uh, yesterday afternoon from Hume Lake Christian Camps, uh, for which I have a great affinity. Uh, It's the first place I heard the voice of the Lord was up there. Um, And so we're welcoming back a number of high school students this morning and also their leaders. Uh, That's why also Joe is not sitting up here and leading the service this morning. Um, that trip is tiring for our adult leaders, uh, and also probably for the kids too. But um, so, welcome back to our high school, uh, high school kids, and our leaders for that. I hope it was a beautiful time up there. I'm excited to hear more about it. Uh, but one of the more trends, just to start somewhere else, one of the more trend, recent trends in theology, especially like the last 30 to 40 years, as uh, these theologians will say, what matters much more than orthodoxy is orthopraxy. What what they mean by that is instead of all the focus on believing the right things, that would be orthodoxy. Instead of all the focus on that, we should really just focus on living the right way. That would be orthopraxy. And so what they're essentially saying is Christianity is not about how you think, it's all about how you live. And so just to kind of get a pulse on us this morning, I wanted to ask us, what do you think about that? We do thumbs up, thumbs sideways, thumbs down, maybe we want to want to out ourselves, right? More about how you live than how you think. Thumbs up. Or just to put it out there, maybe we shouldn't be thinking about this. Because thinking is bad, right? So we should just get together and sing Kumbaya. I'll go. St- anyway, sorry. You can probably tell how I feel about this. Sorry. Uh, but truly, the question is, and it's a serious question, uh, should we just kind of forget about orthodoxy or at the very least emphasize it less? and focus more so on orthopraxy. Worry less about what we believe, focus more on how we live. Now the thing about this, I think it's actually kind of attractive. I really do. In particular, it seems to avoid all the controversies and conflicts surrounding particular doctrines. It seems like sort of a way to move forward from past divisions, to cultivate unity, to create harmony, all that, all of which is good. And so it's kind of like, yes, let's do it, right? Let's forget about what we think and just focus on how we live. Yeah, here's the issue with that. Uh, It's totally a false dichotomy. As if the way you think has no bearing on the way you live. It's literally like telling someone, who cares what the weather is like outside? Stop thinking about it, just dress properly. It's like, um, no, right? Uh, In order to dress properly, properly, we have to know the truth about the weather is like what the weather is like. You see, in the same way, in order to live properly, in order to live a godly life, that is, you have to know what God is like. Otherwise, you're going to be the spiritual equivalent of a guy putting on a parka in July. It's It's foolish. And so you see, one of the convictions you see throughout the scriptures is a false view of God always leads to a false way of life without fail. In other words, if only because God governs the universe in a particular way, if you don't understand what he's like and the way things work, you're also not going to know how to live in the world he has created. And so to quote A.W. Tozer, if you haven't read him before, he is great, uh, but one of the things he said is the most important thing about us as humans is what comes into our mind when we think about God. You see, because get it right, and you can know who God is, and you can live within his will. Uh, But then, get it wrong, you're going to find yourself going against the grain of the universe. And as the old saying goes, go against the grain of the universe, and you're going to get splinters. It doesn't work. And so you see, the point I want to make is knowing who God really is really does matter. 
And here's why I'm bringing this up. Today's Trinity Sunday. I mentioned that at the beginning. And one thing about Trinity Sunday, it's the one and only day on the church calendar that's dedicated to a doctrine. Uh, All the other days on the church calendar are dedicated to particular events, right? Like the birth of Christ is Christmas. The resurrection of Christ is Easter. All these things are events that happen, and yet not today. Today, it is, in fact, about a doctrine. And at least in my experience, the way the doctrine of the Trinity gets presented is it's actually kind of irrelevant. And what I mean is it's often presented as nothing more than a math problem. Like, how can three be one? Or how can one be three? We don't know. It's just kind of a mathematical mystery. Huh? Like, ah, no, right? Uh, that is not the question they are asking. How can three be one or one be three? That's not the question. You see, at least for the church fathers, as they hammered out this doctrine, the question on their minds was much more existential. It mattered much more than math, for example. And in particular, the question was always, how can we know the real God? We want to know him. And so how can we hear his voice? How can we see his heart? How can we know this God in a way that's not just abstract or ethereal, but intimate and personal? That was their question. And you see, the answer that Scripture itself gave to them, which they were just obedient to, is the way you know this God is two things. It's through the Son and in the Spirit. It's sort of the two-part phrase you actually see reflected in our creeds. The way you know God the Father is how it begins is through his Son and in his Spirit. In other words, let me break this down. If you want to see the face of God, first look at Jesus. That's the Son. He is, he is the exact imprint of the very being of God, is the way Hebrews puts it. And so look at Jesus, and then if you want to see the face of Jesus rightly, receive the Spirit. Otherwise, you're not going to get Jesus. You're going to get him wrong. And so you've got to be in the Spirit, is what they would say. And so again, the way to come to a true knowledge of God, meaning the kind of knowledge that actually heals you and saves you and sets you free, is through his Son and in his Spirit. That is the essence of what the doctrine of the Trinity is saying. If only because that is the essence of what the whole New Testament is saying. Uh, So what I want to do for the rest of this is I just want to look at the two parts of that teaching. Uh, Meaning, first of all, through the Son. What does it mean to know God, quote, through his Son? Or why does it matter that we do that? Maybe a better question. And then secondly, that phrase, in the Spirit. Meaning, why do we need the Spirit in order to know Jesus? Can't we just have Jesus and not the Spirit? The answer is no, but I want to look at why. And so again, through the Son in the Spirit, let's start with the first of those, which is the way to know God is through his Son. So in our passage from John, our reading from John chapter 1, it's talking about how the Son of God has revealed the face of God. It's what that whole section is about. In other words, what that's saying is one of the big reasons Jesus came was to open our eyes to the nature of God. That we had become blind to him, and so he came to actually show us. And in particular, the phrase used in our passage is that the God revealed in Jesus, the God revealed in Jesus, Um, is full of grace and truth. That's what it says. That's verse 14, very last part of our reading, that Jesus is the only Son of the Father full of grace and truth. And you see, the thing about that, in the history of humanity, it has always been just one or the other. Meaning it's either a God who is full of grace, very nice, very approachable, or it is a God who is full of truth, not very nice much less very approachable. So one or the other, not both. And yet Jesus reveals a God who is both full of grace and also full of truth. And so if I can just give an example of each and why that matters, uh, for what bearing it has on our life, that is. Uh, Just to start with the first one, right in the middle of the 80s, it was 1985 in particular, a group of 200 quote-unquote biblical scholars, use that word loosely, I think they took it seriously. Um, you'll see what I mean in a minute. Uh, so a group of 200 biblical scholars gathered in Sonoma County, California. Things are going to go awry already. Uh, for what they called the Jesus Seminar. And the thing about the Jesus Seminar, what it was, or at least what they said it was, is it was an attempt to know who the real historical Jesus was. Not the Jesus of the Bible, that is. But the Jesus behind the Bible is what they wanted to find. And so what they did is they took all the sayings of Jesus from the gospel, and then they literally just took a bunch of votes on which ones they thought he definitely said, which ones they thought he maybe said, and then which ones he definitely did not say. 
It was those three different categories. Essentially, yes, maybe, no. And then they voted with color beads, after which everyone made fun of them for using the color beads. They voted with color beads, and then they would debate between votes, and then vote again, and then debate between votes, and vote again. And after the course of six years they did this, what conclusion did they come to? According to them, a full 80% of Jesus' sayings in the Bible are totally fabricated. Aren't you glad you study the Bible? And aren't I glad I spent four years of my life in seminary? <laughs> Seems kind of bad. Uh, 80% of those red letters, at least according to them, Jesus never really said, which also according to them, that's great. It's great. You see, because we're finally getting to the heart of the real Jesus, is what they would say. Don't you want to know the real Jesus? And yet here's the issue with the Jesus seminar. And what people started to notice, the longer they studied the seminar, is the so-called re this so-called real Jesus seemed awfully similar to the scholars who had discovered him. They hated the idea of judgment. Jesus hated the idea of judgment. Or at the very least said nothing about it. They hated the idea that Jesus was the only way to be saved. But that's fine. Jesus never said he was the only way to be saved. That was just the disciples trying to gain momentum for their movement. Uh, they also just kind of figured there's no way Jesus thought he was the son of God. There's no way he would condemn sexual immorality. There is no way he would preach anything other than a message that felt like love. And so you see, when it came to the Jesus seminar, they knew what the real Jesus would say. It's just what people notice is this real Jesus looked a heck of a lot like the highly educated, very white, upper middle class, liberal therapist that a lot of the scholars wanted him to be. In other words, a Jesus who always affirms you. A Jesus who never rebukes you. A Jesus who is always nice. A Jesus who is not at all mad or angry or wrathful. A Jesus who is full of grace, and yet a Jesus who is not full of what? Truth. And you see, that is the classic liberal temptation. Meaning if you tend to lean a little left, which we have congregation members who lean both ways, right? But if you tend to lean a little left, you're going to be prone to have an image of God that is all grace and no truth. Even though the Jesus of the Bible is full of both. And yet the telltale sign we've exchanged the reality of God for an image of our own making is a tendency to disobey his teachings. Or maybe even more so to encourage other people to disobey his teachings. And then at the same time, stand back and watch as things totally fall apart. And yet somehow convince ourselves that everything is okay. Notably, and just to put a pin in this and then we're going to move on. Uh, but the first one to ever ask the question, did God really say that, was who? It was the serpent. Just saying. I'm not going to read too much into that, uh, but not a good example to follow, right? Uh, so that's the more liberal temptation. Uh, and the one thing I'll say about this sermon, it is one of my heartfelt goals to, this morning to be an equal opportunity offender. So conservatives, buckle your seats. Let's go, right? Uh, so you may remember this. We're going to look at the more conservative temptation, right? Depending on kind of our internal makeup and also the way we were raised, we're going to lean one way or the other, and the devil will tempt us on both sides, okay? Uh, so we're going to look at the more conservative temptation. You may remember this uh, in the news, but in 2018, a terrorist uh, in France took a bunch of people hostage in a grocery store. Uh, in particular, he came in with a gun, a gun and a knife. He killed a bunch of people right off the bat, and then at a particular point, he took one woman hostage. And he was using her as a human shield, right? So the cops couldn't do anything. He's like holding, him up or holding her up in front of him. You see, what happened at a certain point is a man by the name of Arnaud Beltram just kind of calmly approached this guy, this terrorist. He actually engaged him in conversation. And then he eventually convinced him to let him trade places with the woman. I'll be your shield. That's what he essentially said. And so he took her place, probably knowing full well what was going to happen. It's because in what followed, Arna Beltram was brutally killed by multiple stab and gunshot wounds, giving up his life 
so that that woman could go free. And you see, the way that people talked about it afterwards, especially in the news, it was said to be an act of heroism in the face of evil, is what you heard. And I wouldn't disagree with that. I think it was definitely an act of heroism in the face of evil. But at the same time, I would say that on a deeper level than just good guy versus bad guy, what was going on in that grocery store, what was competing in that grocery store, were two very different views of God. One of them being the God of an Islamic terrorist, and the other one being the God of a Christian martyr. And what is the difference? The God of a terrorist is kind of mean and mad. You can see it in his people. The God of a martyr is actually good and gracious. You ought to see it in his people. The God of a terrorist, when people go against his will, he has no idea how to handle it. And so his people tend to get frustrated and forceful. The God of a martyr, when people go against his will, he is fine. He can totally handle it. He makes all things work together for the good of those who love him. And so he wants his people just to be forgiving and faithful. The God of a terrorist is petty. The God of a martyr is perfect. The God of a terrorist is small. The God of a martyr is great. The God of a terrorist is weak. The God of a martyr is powerful. The God of a terrorist kind of hates this world. And wants to blow sinners away. The God of a martyr actually loves this world. And wants to bear its sin away. It could not be more different. You see, the question you've got to ask is, where did each of those two get their understanding of God? I'm not going to speak for the terrorists. That's not my job. Uh, but I will speak for the Christian. For Arnold Beltram in particular, he got his understanding of God through the Son. Meaning Jesus, who gave up his life so that others could go free. And so what did this Arnold Beltram do? He gave up his life so that others could go free. He knew a God who is not only full of truth, but also full of what? Grace. But you see, here's the thing, and this is not going to be a popular point. I will seed the fact. I'm going to make it anyway. Uh, but as much as we might want to identify with a Christ-like martyr, like, I want to be that guy, uh, the classic conservative temptation is to be a bit of a terrorist. Things aren't landing well this morning, are they? <laughs> And I say this as someone who leans conservative, okay? And the thing is, just to be clear, I'm not saying an Islamic terrorist and a conservative Christian are the same thing. I've heard people try to make that case. It's not at all true, not even close. It's kind of a dumb claim. So I'm not saying we're the same, but I am saying we tend to be prone to make the same mistake. Uh, namely, to worship a God who is full of truth, but void of grace. And kind of the telltale sign that this is us is whenever people wrong us, what flows more naturally from our heart than forgiveness is frustration. We cannot imagine a God who loves both us and our enemy. Am I right? And so in the same way, those of us with more liberal tendencies like to make a God in our own image, those of us of more conservative tendencies also like to make a God in our own image. In fact, the old saying is, in the beginning, God created man in his image, and ever since, man has been trying to return the favor. Ah. And yet, if there's one thing you could say about the doctrine of the Trinity, it's that it's meant to be an emphatic no to that project. You see, because the real image of God is Christ. In other words, you want to see the face of God look at Christ crucified. And what you will see is that he is way kinder than we conservatives could imagine. And also way more convicting than we liberals care to admit. In other words, full of grace and also full of truth. And it is through him that we can see God. Now, so let's go to the second part, in the Spirit. I mean, the way to know God is not only through the Son, but also in the Spirit. 
And the question I put out there earlier was, why do we need the Spirit? Can't we just have Jesus? Forget about the Spirit. No, but let's look at why. I was kind of random, but I want you to imagine a husband and a wife. And what's remarkable about this husband, this imaginary husband and wife, um, is that they know literally everything about each other. Uh, for whatever reason, they've both been really good at just kind of studying each other. And what I mean is they pay really close attention to what the other person does. They've done a really good job of learning each other's stories. They totally know each other's likes and dislikes, their greatest goals, their biggest pet peeves, everything about that they know. Uh, they would crush it on the newlywed game. If you're, I'm probably dating myself. My parents were on that one before I was born. because They failed miserably. Anyway, uh, so you see, when it comes to this couple, pretty much everyone is impressed with how well they know each other. Their public image is, in fact, impeccable. And yet, in the secret of their home, where no one else sees, there's palpable distance between them. They'll literally go days on end with no communication. They rarely, if ever, talk. There's little to no emotional connection or chemistry. And kind of the kicker, over the course of 20 years of marriage, they have been intimate maybe a handful of times, three to four max. And so the question I want to put out there regarding this marriage, do they know each other? Do they know each other? I thought you left when I made the other point a little bit while back. I think other people thought it too. Anyway, sorry. Uh, <laughs> do they know each other is the question between this married couple. Uh, and the thing is, for sure, they know about each other, right? They know everything about each other. But you see, that's not the question, right? Do they really know each other is the question. And it's kind of tricky. Is it not? Uh, in particular, it depends on what we mean by the word know or knowledge. See, one thing about the concept of knowledge uh, is it means totally different things depending on the culture in which you find yourself. And so in Western culture in particular, the connotations we have surrounding that word knowledge tend to be deeply rooted in what's called the Enlightenment. Now, that was in the 1700s. It was a highly rationalistic movement. It was all about your brain, you could say. And so for us, coming out of that, we are descendants of that. And when we say that we know something, I tend to think what we mean is we have a rational understanding of it. And so the question, if you think about this question, how do you, quote unquote, know God? You come to a rational understanding of who he is. And so what do you do? You study the Bible. You listen to sermons. You take a bunch of classes. You read a bunch of books. All because what it means to know God is that you have to come to a rational understanding of who he has revealed himself in Christ to be. All of which, by the way, is great. I wouldn't have a job if those things were not part of our practice. <laughs> I feel like I'm up here sawing off the branch I'm currently sitting on. Just to appear behind the, under the pulpit. Anyway, uh, they're good things, right? They're good things. They're important. And yet, here's the thing about it. Uh, we can come to a rational understanding of God and still not know God. In other words, we can have the kind of relationship with Christ where everyone outside the marriage, you're the bride of Christ, everyone outside the marriage thinks everything must be fine. You know so much about him. Right? And yet in the secret of our heart where no one else sees, there's palpable distance between us and Jesus. We rarely, if ever, truly communicate with him. Meaning our prayer life is perfunctory at best. There's little to no emotional connection or chemistry. We're not in tune with this heart. Genuine intimacy with him. Meaning those instances where you're incredibly close. Strong sense of his presence, walking in step with his will. That has happened maybe just a handful of times in the 20 years you've believed. And the thing is, what's tricky about this is according to the Enlightenment view of knowledge, we'd still be inclined to say, I know God. And yet, according to the biblical view of knowledge, no, we don't. You see, when the Bible talks about knowing something, it's not talking about just having a rational understanding of it. And in fact, the Hebrew word for knowing something is yada, yada. Um, some people have guessed, they're not sure, uh, but they think it's where we get the phrase yada, yada, yada. 
uh, comes from Seinfeld. They're Jewish. They speak Hebrew. Yada, 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 meaning you know, you know, you know. And throughout the Old Testament, to yada something is to have intimacy with it. For instance, Adam yadad Eve, and she conceived and bore a child. Abraham yadad Sarah, she conceived and bore a child. Jacob yadad Rachel, they conceived and bore a child. And so how do we know? So, so you see, to yada something, meaning to really know something, is to have intimacy with it. And so how do we know God through Christ? By having intimacy with God through Christ. And you see, the way to have intimacy with Christ is not just to study him from afar. It is to receive his spirit within. The thing is, I can make it sound like kind of a one-time thing, right? And don't get me wrong, there does need to be a point at which, and maybe multiple points at which, we make a full and unconditional surrender to the Lord. And most of us, at least in my experience, we've got to come back to that over and over again. Uh, But still, the point I want to make is without that, there's not going to be real intimacy if we're trying to keep him at a safe distance. And yet at the same time, assuming that is in fact the posture of our heart, that thing is in place, uh, there also need to be what are called spiritual practices that are cultivating closeness to Christ. Um, One thing about those practices, a lot of them look very different from how our Western Protestant church typically does ministry. You see, we tend to lean pretty hard into this rationalistic view of knowledge, uh, which is why we tend to do a lot of study, a lot of classes, a lot of long sermons, all of which are great, by the way. Um, No, they're an important part of our practice as a people. And yet, you go to the most vibrant eras in the church's history where the spirit is free and active and moving. And some of their practices are noteworthy. Just as much as soaking in sermons, they would also sit in silence. Just as much as reading a lot of the Bible, they would also write out a lot of their prayers. Slows them down to commune with Christ, right? Just as much as they would take a class from a teacher, they would also confess their sins to a confessor. And so all these things that didn't really fill their head with facts about Jesus... but were aimed at filling their hearts with the spirit of Jesus. You see, because the way to know God is through his son and in his spirit. So to jump back to our Old Testament reading, it's from Genesis 1. We're just going to tie it with John 1. Uh, Genesis 1, it's about God creating the world. It's a beautiful reading. And one of the things more recent scholarship has pointed out, good scholarship, that is, not Jesus Seminar Scholarship. Um, Good scholarship has pointed out about Genesis 1 is it actually follows the exact same pattern as a temple construction. Meaning, whenever you read about temples in the ancient world, including the consecration of the temple in Exodus, including the building of the temple in 1 Kings, it always happens either in seven days or seven years. It's always got the number seven associated with it. And then it always proceeds from being something kind of chaotic to being something absolutely beautiful. That's just kind of the nature of of a temple construction narrative. You see it all over the place, not just in the Bible, but in the ancient world as a whole. And so you see the fact that Genesis 1 follows that pattern. What that means is when God created this world, it was meant to be his temple. Filled with his presence, that is. That was his plan with this world. And in fact, you see it in the Genesis passage when you read it. It's the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the waters. Waters throughout the Old Testament is symbolic of chaos. So the Spirit of God is hovering over the chaos, and what God does is he begins speaking. And what you see is what the Word of God does is it orders the chaos. It brings beauty out of the mess would be another way to put that. The point of which is to prepare a place for God's Spirit to dwell. And so that was the original plan of the creation. After that was the fall, which is essentially the very long and inglorious slide back into chaos that we all see around us. We're born into it now. It's chaos in the world. It's chaos in our life. And maybe most of all, it's the chaos internally. 
That's just kind of the nature of being fallen. And yet here's the thing. You go to our New Testament. So John, Genesis 1 to John 1, and it begins the same way in, as Genesis. In the beginning. Same three words as if to say, God still has the same goal of finding a place to dwell. And the thing is, you read the rest of John, and what God is doing is he is, in fact, building a new temple. And in particular, his temple is a people over whom the Spirit of God hovers. It's no accident that the church is often referred to with the number seven. It's a temple. It's a people that is over over whom the Spirit of God hovers, meaning everything chaotic, Inside of us, God hovers over it. And then what he does is he begins to speak into it. Speak his word, that is, which is Jesus. He's the word of God, the son of God. But as God speaks and his spirit works, what happens is order comes out of the chaos. Beauty comes out of the mess. The point of which is to prepare a place where the Spirit of God can dwell. Namely, your heart. You are God's temple, is what you see in the New Testament. Or at least, that's what he wants. He wants you to know him, not in some abstract, ethereal, far-off way, but in an intimate, personal, and very near way. And so if you want that, I invite you to open up whatever chaos is going on in your life, in your heart, all of it. Open it up to his word so that he can begin to prepare a place for his spirit. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord God in heaven, for the revelation of yourself in the person of Jesus Christ, we thank you for that. Uh, Father, in particular, for what you have revealed, that you're a God who is so much greater than what we typically imagine, Uh, that you're full of grace and full of truth. Uh, Lord God, that you're full of life and love and all the things we so desperately need. And so God, we pray that you would fill us with those things. Fill us with yourself, that is, by the gift of your own spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen.